It's SimCity. Welcome back to Super NES Works, formerly known as Mode 7. Why the change to Super NES Works? Well, quite simply, once this series became part of Retronauts, everyone concerned recommended we unify the names of all these game-by-game retrospective video projects under a common title. Much as I liked the Game Boy World name, there's been a website called NES World for about 20 years, so I kind of feel like they own that name. Plus, Game Boy World worked because that series explores the Game Boy system library across the world whereas the Super NES and NES series focus specifically on the U.S. market. Anyway, works sounds pretty similar to world, and it also conveys the idea of totality and comprehensiveness. You know, like the works. So again, welcome back to Super NES Works. The first three games Nintendo published for the Super NES at its US launch neatly summarized the company's ambitions for the platform. We had F-Zero, which approached the task of presenting an arcade-style racer by relying on the system's Mode 7 technology. We had Super Mario World, which could afford to take a slower and more methodical approach to the series than its predecessors thanks to the addition of battery-powered saves. Now Mario fans could record their progress and effect permanent changes to the game world as they advanced. And finally, there was Pilot Wings, which also used Mode 7 tech to create a decent riff on the PC flight sim. While more limited in scope than something like Microsoft Flight Simulator due to the console's innate memory limitations, it also presented players with greater variety than its forebears. The fourth and final Nintendo published Super NES launch title rounds out the company's statement of intent for the system by giving players a great rendition of a hot contemporary PC gaming hit, Maxis's SimCity. At the time of SimCity's initial release on the Japanese Super Famicom, the original PC game was about two years old and was still selling like gangbusters on every computer platform under the sun. SimCity had not, however, appeared on any console. With its open sandbox-style design and numerous moving parts, SimCity was simply too demanding for a closed-box console. By bringing the game over to the Super NES, Nintendo was sending a strong message. Their new console would be a step beyond everything that had come before. Sure, every system had PC games like Sokoban and even Lemmings, but what other console would allow you to play this cutting-edge PC Smash? In fact, Nintendo felt so strongly about SimCity that the company developed it internally. When a company with control freak tendencies as pronounced as Nintendo's handles someone else's property internally, you know they mean business. A look back at the early days of the NES can provide some additional context to help demonstrate just how much gravity this project had. Nintendo very rarely dealt directly with third-party properties, always preferring to focus on its own original works. The two instances I can find of the company taking on development duties for someone else's game go back to the NES launch, with Kung Fu and Ten Yard Fight. Both those games originally hailed from IREM, yet Nintendo didn't simply publish the NES conversions in the US, they co-developed them. And Nintendo had plenty of reason to set its sights on a game like SimCity as a proof of concept for the Super NES. The very first third-party breakout hit for its original Famicom console in Japan had been Hudson's excellent reimagining of Doug Smith's Load Runner, a PC game whose popularity on Nintendo's console cemented Japan as the largest market for that series from that point on. Nintendo took an approach here very similar to Hudson's with Load Runner. The Super NES take on SimCity captured the essence of that fresh new PC release, but added plenty of embellishments unique to the console. Coincidentally, the Load Runner property itself belonged to Broderbund, who published Hudson's adaptation on NES in the US and Europe. Broderbund also published the NES version of a game called Raid on Bungling Bay, an inventive hybrid of shooter and real-time strategy designed by a young man named Will Wright. While developing Bungling Bay, Wright realized that the act of playing through the final game itself wasn't nearly so interesting as the creative process involved in laying down the cities and factories that served as the backdrop for the game's action. Drawing on the DIY sandbox approach of Bill Budge's revolutionary pinball construction set, Wright began tinkering with the idea of a game that revolved around the act of building and managing urban complexes. The result, five years later, was a little thing called SimCity. 
Of course, part of the reason why SimCity took a full five years to come to market was because Wright had trouble finding a publisher willing to take a chance on a game that didn't obey the standard rules of gaming. SimCity didn't have a hero or conflict. Players took on the role of a civic planner trying to create the most efficient and viable urban landscape possible. There was no proper ending to the game. The closest thing to a victory condition was to establish a sort of financial stasis, in which the city's revenues and systems created a self-sustaining cycle independent of the player's watchful eye. Eventually, though, the game made its way to market and promptly became a towering sensation, in defiance of its naysayers. Let's talk about the baseline concept at work here. SimCity begins by providing the player with an empty patch of land, a palette of construction options, and some cash. From there, your task is to put together a functioning city. You allocate land according to three categories, residential, industrial, and commercial. SimCity mostly consists of a balancing act. You have to concern yourself with matters such as access to utilities, feeding each cluster of commercial or residential construction with power from industrial zones. But industrial zones cause pollution. High population density results in crime and fire. You can install police and fire departments to mitigate these, but those cost tax dollars. Raising taxes too high is one of many ways to create disgruntled residents who angrily depart for less expensive homes. Citizens will become annoyed by other factors as well, such as traffic congestion. And even once you have everything else in hand, natural disasters will hit your poor city from time to time, throwing all your hard work into disarray. A surprisingly complex simulation emerges from this handful of play factors. SimCity challenges players at their own pace, requiring them to balance the mechanisms of running a city with the demands and happiness of its citizens. Making pragmatic choices to keep things plugging along inevitably makes people angry. While such a frustrating recreation of reality hardly sounds like the most relaxing way to kill a few hours, SimCity manages to make it work. There's something weirdly engrossing about watching your tiny imaginary city come together and evolve into an efficient little machine. The game offers guidance as you need it, especially on Super NES, and you can pull up helpful data to inform your choices. It's also a handy object lesson on the relationship between industry and pollution. Coal power plants cost less than nuclear, but create far more waste. And also on the importance of mass transit for easing the strain of commuting in high-density populations. A game of SimCity played well tends to inspire people to look at actual American cities like Washington DC or Los Angeles, wonder why the real world can't get its act together. Nintendo's version of SimCity carries forward all of these elements, but it throws in a few changes. Some of these are superficial fan service. For example, the Godzilla-like monster attack natural disaster now features a marauding Bowser, and a booming city will erect a Mario statue to commemorate its critical milestone. New to this version of the game were a handful of special structures that generally allowed for more efficient play. A number of other Super NES exclusive elements seem to have been introduced to make the game a bit easier. You can build several unique properties that help increase land value and annual income. And there's also a bank that can provide a loan to help kickstart your city's growth in a pinch. SimCity for Super NES sadly made its debut before the console's mouse, which wouldn't arrive for another year. So the biggest downside to this conversion of the game is that everything has to be managed with a D-pad. It's not that big an inconvenience, though. Nintendo overhauled the game from top to bottom to better fit the Super NES, and they certainly paid attention to the user interface in the process. The graphics have a little more character, and the status update screens feature a green-haired fellow named Dr. Wright, an homage to SimCity designer Will Wright, who poses and emotes as he relays the latest info about your progress as a virtual mayor. Meanwhile, this version's unique music, written by Super Mario Kart composer Sayo Oka, gives this take on SimCity a relaxing vibe like no other rendition of the game, while nicely showing off the Super NES's unique audio capabilities. Nintendo's efforts paid off. SimCity proved to be every bit as big a hit on Super NES as it was on PC, and as Loadrunner had been on Famicom, entering the ranks of million sellers and becoming a permanent element of Nintendo canon. Dr. Wright has put in appearances in a number of games, including The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening and Smash Bros. Furthermore, Nintendo followed up on this rendition of SimCity twice in the following years, though those later first-party SimCity titles never left Japan. First, this version of SimCity was reworked for the BSX Satellaview download service to create a competitive take on management called BS SimCity Town Planning Competition. A few years after that, the handful of people who bought the 64DD add-on for Nintendo 64 enjoyed the ambitious SimCity 64, which probably would have done incredibly well had it not been tied to a failed peripheral that never left Japan. Sadly, the only way to play the wonderful Super NES adaptation of SimCity nowadays is to hunt down the original cartridge. Nintendo made it available on Wii Virtual Console for several years, but it's since been delisted and hasn't shown up anywhere else. 
It's definitely worth tracking down though. Nintendo crafted a totally unique rendition of the classic city management simulation for Super NES, and it shows off the potential of the console in a totally different and decidedly less flashy way than games like F-Zero and Pilot Wings. While those two action vehicles made for entertaining tech showcases, it's SimCity and Super Mario World that really speak to the direction Nintendo would push their new console. Bigger, more intricate, slower paced works than had been seen on the original NES. That trend would work against the Super NES when competitors emphasized the zippy speed of their own consoles versus Nintendo's more deliberate approach. On the other hand, SimCity's exclusive console outing on the Super NES spoke to those who wanted a different gaming experience, or to people whose families couldn't afford computers back when PCs fell more on the luxury end of the spectrum. Unlike Pilot Wings, though, SimCity for Super NES is more than just a statement of intent. This game is still as addicting and entertaining as ever, more than 25 years later. Next on Super NES Works, Konami also attempts to recreate its own early 8-bit successes and totally blows it. 